James Aquila Hutzler was born on February 11, 2002, to parents Vicki and David Hutzler, and went by the nickname Mackie. At the age of nine, Mackie was living with his father, David, who went by Davey, at 436 Apple Harvest Drive in Glengarry, West Virginia. Around 8 a.m. on January 6, 2012, authorities were called to a fire at the mobile home where Mackie and Davey lived. Once the fire was out, firefighters found the deceased bodies of Mackie and Davy. It was originally reported that Davy shot and killed his son before setting fire to the trailer and taking his own life despite no gun being located at the scene. However, it wasn't long before new evidence was found that suggested their deaths were not the result of a murder-suicide. Upon further investigation, canine units found traces of accelerants in four places in the trailer and none on Davy. However, Mackie was found with accelerant on 18% of his body. An autopsy later determined that one bullet had grazed little Mackie's chin before a second bullet took his life. It was also later discovered that Davy was once a member of the Republic for the United States of America which is one of the largest anti-government, sovereign citizens groups active in the United States today. Davy had broken away from the Republic to form a new sovereign group called Vandalia Solution. On January 3rd, three days before he died, he posted a rant on a popular anti-government forum warning that the federal government was systemically dismantling the U.S. currency. In some of his last online postings, he seemed paranoid that the federal government was after him. Among his final words were these, I think I've said quite enough to put my life in danger today. While there is no indication that their murders had anything to do with Davy's involvement in a sovereign citizens group, some feel that it's a cover-up by the government to protect the real murderers. Since the murders, four different investigators have worked on the case. At the beginning of this investigation, the lead detective, Trooper Brand, was fired for fraud for receiving money from the state he was not entitled to just months after the double murder. Trooper Brand also allegedly gave away 54 firearms to a family member on the day of the murders. The second detective received the case, but it only had four pages with it. The governor's office has taken the family statement three times, but the files allegedly disappear every time. Mackie's older sister and Davy's daughter, Kelly Jo Hutzler, have relentlessly sought justice for her little brother and father, but as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Yasmin Rayon Akri was born in Kentucky on October 25, 1992. However, her mother was a drug addict, and Yasmin spent several years in the Kentucky foster care system where she was sexually abused and developed severe emotional and behavioral problems. In 2001, nine-year-old Yasmin and her brother went to live with Rose May Starnes in the 4800 block of West Congress Parkway in Chicago, Illinois. Rose was their aunt by marriage, and she adopted the children in 2006. By the age of 15, Yasmin was a freshman at Austin Polytech Academy and about to start a new job. She was an excellent student and salutatorian in her 8th grade class. Still, when she started high school, her grades began to slip. In 2007, her 16-year-old brother asked Rose if he could leave the home, and she agreed. This left Yasmin alone in the basement bedroom, isolated from the rest of the family. On January 15, 2008, Yasmin had a half day of school and then went to her local YMCA. She returned home to do a load of laundry before going to bed. Rose and her daughter decided to spend the night at a casino in Elgin, Illinois, leaving Rose's live-in boyfriend at home with Yasmin. The next day, the boyfriend noticed the locks on the basement door and a fence outside were cut. It appeared that someone had burglarized the basement area of the home where Yasmin's bedroom was, but nothing appeared to be missing or disturbed in the room. Yasmin was also nowhere to be found, but they assumed she had gone to school. 
However, when she failed to return, they reported her missing. Her family has criticized the police investigation into her case, claiming investigators assumed she was a runaway and failed to look into other possible causes of her disappearance. Even though a padlock had been cut, police told Rose they didn't see any signs of forced entry and believed she might have run away and would probably return. Although police entered her name into a missing person database, they never launched a search for her. Authorities have since admitted to making serious errors at the onset of the investigation by waiting two days to dust for fingerprints and not taking the broken lock from the basement door. Rose stated that she loves Yasmin and was confident that she hadn't run away from home, but admitted that things hadn't always been great between them. She had trouble dealing with Yasmin's behavior problems and occasionally disciplined her by whipping her with a belt or locking her in the basement. Jimmy Terrell Smith and his father, who was friends with Rose, lived in the second floor apartment before Yasmin's disappearance. Jimmy moved into the building in 2005 after he was paroled from prison where he had been serving a 10-year sentence for attempted murder. After his release, he was arrested six more times and admitted he was always armed and sold drugs near Yasmin's apartment. He reportedly took an interest in Yasmin, and she mentioned him twice in her diary. Although he had moved out by the time Yasmin disappeared, according to friends, he continued to keep in contact with her. By the time the police had learned of this, Jimmy was back in jail, charged with sexually assaulting five females, two of whom were just 14 years old. Rose later claimed that she had suspected Jimmy from the start, but said she didn't mention it to the police because she had no evidence and didn't want to hurt his reputation. Detectives interviewed Jimmy several times in 2011, hoping he would break down and tell them where Yasmin was. At one point, they obtained a search warrant for a house belonging to one of Jimmy's ex-girlfriends, but failed to find anything relevant to their case. Although no evidence has been found linking him to Yasmin's case, he still remains a person of interest. Jimmy agreed to speak with reporters from the Chicago Tribune while awaiting trial in jail. He claimed to have no involvement in Yasmin's disappearance, but admitted that he did know what had happened to her. However, he wouldn't give any details, but seemed to indicate that she was no longer alive. Rose died of natural causes in 2014 at the age of 57. Yasmin's family continues to plead for answers. It was reported that the family contacted Smith, who is currently serving a 100-plus year sentence for attempting to hire a hitman to murder the judge who convicted him of sexual assault charges. During that meeting, he alleged that Yasmin took her own life and he assisted her. However, that has never been substantiated, and her family still wonders if she is alive. But as of 2023, she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. At the age of 35, Margaret Christine Tapp and her nine-year-old daughter, Shauna Lee Tapp, were living at 13 Kelvin Drive in Ferntree Gully in Victoria, Australia. On the night of August 6, 1984, or early on August 7, Margaret and Shauna were asleep in their beds when a killer entered their home, subjecting them to a horrifying ordeal. Later that day, James Jim Rowland arrived at her home around 6 p.m. to pick up Margaret for their opera date. However, after knocking on the door and receiving no response, he made his way to the back door, which had a faulty lock on it. After entering the home, Jim discovered their lifeless bodies still in their beds. Now in a state of shock and crying, Jim rushed to the neighbor's home to call for help. During the investigation, rope fibers were found around Margaret and Shauna's necks, indicating they were both strangled to death. Investigators believe the perpetrator began by strangling Margaret to prevent her from protecting her little girl. A neighbor recalled hearing a muffled scream shortly after 11 p.m., followed by their dog growling. Across the road, residents were startled when Shauna's typically quiet spaniel began barking and howling around midnight. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough for neighbors to call the authorities. 
Since there were no signs of forced entry and the victims were attacked in their beds, it was speculated that the perpetrator was probably known to them and aware of the broken lock on the back door. Witnesses would report seeing a red utility vehicle parked nearby around the time of the murders. When the investigation into the horrendous double murders began, the police had many persons of interest to investigate, including a married doctor who Margaret had been involved with. He even owned the house that Margaret was living in. There was also Margaret's husband, Donald Tapp, who she had been separated from for many years. Topping the suspect list was a family that lived near the Tapp home. Margaret had let one of them mow her lawn and clean her car, a decision that worried neighbors who warned her of sexually suggestive remarks he'd made to other women. For 20 years after the murders, neither he, his three brothers, nor his stepfather were eliminated by forensic testing. A sister of the same family lived in a caravan beside the house with a boyfriend, later jailed for sexual assault. Then there was the instructor who gave Margaret free truck driving lessons and the Shell employee who she had gone out with before. Her career as a nurse at various hospitals allowed her to establish a diverse network of friends, widening her social circle even further and leading to many possible suspects. A coworker of Margaret's described her as a real bitch who had a habit of ridiculing her lovers and goading them about their lack of sexual expertise. This led investigators to believe the murderer was most likely a spurned or current lover of Margaret's. Margaret had many admirers, and Jim, the man who found their bodies, was among them. However, throughout all his interrogations, his account remained consistent and credible. Numerous fingerprints were discovered around the house. Unfortunately, they were all dismissed as belonging to friends or relatives of the Tapp family. Not a single set of stranger prints was identified. Years later, through DNA testing, Jim and Margaret's ex-husband Donald were eliminated from the suspect list. During the investigation, the police found two distinct types of hair on Shauna's nightgown and bedding. However, these hairs couldn't be matched to any suspects police had on file, but they could have come from anywhere and didn't necessarily identify a suspect. The wife of the doctor that Margaret was having an affair with found a tape her husband and Margaret had made of themselves having sex. Relatives and friends of Margaret told police that she even admitted to making the sex tape. The doctor hid the video in his house, and the doctor's wife found it after her husband died. She then angrily confronted Margaret about the explicit tape. The doctor's wife had a key to the tap home as her husband had one on his car key ring. Police have discovered the doctor's wife was very friendly with a pedophile. She lived with a pedophile when the double murders occurred. Documents found by police reveal the doctor's wife paid the pedophile $52,000 around the time the mother and daughter were murdered. Investigators also found letters from relatives of the dead doctor who said the doctor's wife hated Margaret and was capable of murdering her. The doctor's wife told police that Margaret had once begged her husband to leave the marital home and come and live with her. She claimed Margaret threw a rock through their window and then stripped naked before lying on the front lawn. The doctor told his wife and daughter to hide in a bedroom while he calmed Margaret down and drove her home. The confrontations between the two women continued after the doctor's death. Margaret took legal action to get ownership of the Fern Tree Gully house the doctor allowed her to live in. Margaret was convinced the doctor had made a will in which he left her the house and accused the doctor's wife of destroying that will. In the end, she was given half of the Fern Tree Gully home and bought the other half from the doctor's estate. As for the crime scene, DNA was found on Shauna's nightgown, and Dunlop Volley tennis shoe prints were discovered in Margaret's bedroom and the bathroom. The shoe size did not match that of Margaret, Shauna, or any other known individuals. On the day the bodies were discovered, Margaret's sister, Joan, mentioned the name of a retired policeman who Margaret said had been visiting her and showering her with gifts. Margaret, along with Shauna and her teenage son, had visited the man's property where he captured a photograph of them together. 
The police officer remained a suspect for 20 years before finally being eliminated by DNA in 2005. However, in August 2008, Russell John Gisa was charged with the crime after the lab matched his DNA. However, it was discovered after he was charged that an unrelated exhibit containing Gisa's DNA from a sexual assault he committed was tested at the Victoria Police Laboratory on the same day and in the same place as material from the tap crime scene, which led to Gisa's DNA being mistakenly transferred to the tap exhibit. Further tests after Gisa's arrest revealed his DNA did not match DNA left at the TAP crime scene, and the murder charges were dropped. This also forced the Victoria Police to change how it handles DNA evidence. In 2015, investigators reopened the case in a cold case review, including the help of well-known ex-investigator Ron Ittles. In 2017, a $1 million reward was offered for information that could lead to a conviction, but as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. Strangely, two women went missing a week apart in February 2014 in Humboldt County, California. They allegedly didn't know each other, but were last seen by the same man. Danielle Nicole Bertolini was born on March 6, 1990, and grew up in Maine. In 2010, Danielle's life was turned upside down by the tragic loss of her unborn son, Xavier. She then turned to drugs as a way to self-medicate and immediately left Maine and moved to Humboldt County, California. This area is home to some of the tallest trees in the world, the giant redwoods, but also for its illegal activity, violence, and many missing people. Humboldt County is one of three counties that makes up the so-called Emerald Triangle, an area famous for marijuana cultivation, both legal and black market. It's an area that has long attracted people looking to get closer to nature or sometimes to escape. Danielle then got a job trimming marijuana crops until she disappeared. Humboldt County is also surrounded by a famous peak dubbed Murder Mountain, where multiple people have gone missing and died. It initially got its nickname after serial killer couple Michael Bayer Carson and Suzanne Carson hid out there after murdering 26-year-old Clark Stevens in 1982, seeking refuge in the trees while police tried to capture them. But after that, the name stuck due to all the missing and murdered people in the county. Danielle last spoke to her family on January 29, 2014. She allegedly got herself involved with a bad group of people and her drug abuse escalated. On February 9, 2014, Danielle got a ride to town from a friend of an acquaintance, James Jim Eugene Jones, near Bridgeville in the Swains Flat area of Humboldt County, California. She was never seen alive again. Jones was also the last person seen with Sheila Franks, who vanished a week earlier on February 2, 2014. 38-year-old Sheila was the mother of a son when she went missing and was last seen at Jones's house in Fortuna, California. He said she went for a walk and never returned. A year later, in 2015, Danielle's skull was found deep in the woods near Eel River. In 2019, a femur bone was discovered 13 miles downstream from where Danielle's skull was found. Investigators determined that the femur belonged to Sheila. On May 26, 2014, the families of both Sheila and Danielle joined together to search for their missing loved ones. In March 2015, Fortuna police chief went on record saying he believed both Sheila and Danielle's cases were connected and the same man was a suspect in both. On April 1, 2015, Sheila and Danielle were combined with three others in a campaign to highlight their loss, and they became known as the Humboldt Missing Five. The victims include Sheila, Danielle, Jennifer Wilmer, Karen Mitchell, and Christine Walters. All five women have similar looks and backstories and have gone missing or been found murdered in the same area. Even though all five women have been lumped together, some believe that only Danielle and Sheila's cases are connected. 21-year-old Jennifer Jade Wilmer was the first of the five to vanish. 
She grew up in Long Island and moved to Humboldt County in 1992. She had plans to enroll in the College of the Redwoods, but the classes were full, so she began waitressing and looking for other work. She was last spotted in Willow Creek in September 1993, and foul play is suspected. Technically, Jade was living in Trinity County when she disappeared, but she was last seen between Hawkins Bar and Willow Creek and had previously lived in Eureka. After her daughter's disappearance, Jade's mother, Susan, helped push through Jennifer's law, which requires states to report information concerning unidentified bodies into the National Crime Information Center, NCIC, database. This procedure provides easier cross-referencing of missing persons and unidentified victims in the U.S. 16-year-old Karen Mitchell disappeared four years later in November 1997 in Eureka. Karen attended school in the area and worked at Coastal Family Development Center. According to the Charlie Project, she was last seen possibly getting into a light blue four-door sedan. Robert Durst, a suspected serial killer linked to three deaths, was spotted in the area months later, and the Charlie Project speculates that his likeness matches a sketch of the driver of that sedan. He has not been ruled out as a possible suspect and at the time lived in Trinidad. In November 2008, Christine Walters, a 23-year-old Wisconsin native, vanished shortly after walking out of a copy store in Eureka. Just one week earlier, she was found bloodied and bruised on a doorstep, begging the residents to bring her to a hospital for help. She was a junior at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, where she studied both botany and ethnobotany. She was visiting friends in the area and had become interested in spirituality and environmental causes. There are also several missing men in the area, including Jeff Joseph, who disappeared in June 2014. Family members of both women remain very active on social media, working together on the Facebook page Help Find Sheila Franks and Danielle Bertolini, as well as organizing search efforts. However, as of 2023, all five of these cases remain unsolved. Sylvia Salinas was born in Galveston, Texas on January 7, 1959. At the age of 30, Sylvia had remained in Galveston, where she owned a grocery store named Salinas Food Store in the same neighborhood where she grew up. Sylvia was well-known and loved in her community for her friendly attitude and welcoming environment at her small grocery store. She was also kind-hearted and generous, often helping customers by advancing store credit until they were paid. Sylvia was also extremely diligent and aware of her surroundings, especially when alone in the store, and even kept a loaded revolver under the cashier counter for protection. On the morning of October 31, 1989, her parents, Derlise and Maria, had stopped by to visit and help with some tasks around the store. Later that afternoon, Derlise and Maria left the store to walk the two blocks back to their home for some lunch. This was the last time they saw their daughter alive. Soon after her parents left, Sylvia was murdered in broad daylight at the store. At 1.22 p.m., a private alarm company received an alert that a robbery was taking place at the store. Four minutes later, the Galveston police arrived and entered the store. That's when they found Sylvia behind the counter, slumped over in a pool of blood. She had been stabbed in the chest with a butcher knife, which sat next to her on the counter. Sylvia's machete and loaded revolver were still under the counter untouched. Because of the position of her body and the lack of visible self-defense wounds, it appeared as though Sylvia was caught off guard by the attack. The blood-spattered cash register was on the counter, just inches from where Sylvia sat. The drawer of the register had been forced open and emptied of all bills, leaving behind coin change and food stamps. The drawer had significant blood smears, leading investigators to speculate that it had been pried open with the same knife used to kill Sylvia. When the killer forcibly opened the cash register, an unseen silent alarm was triggered, alerting the alarm company. Based on the timing of the alert, investigators believe she was murdered at 1.20 p.m. 
Investigators theorize that the assailant knew Sylvia and the comings and goings of people at the Salinas food store, considering the murder was committed in the afternoon in broad daylight on Halloween, a popular and busy day in Galveston. One thing that remained unknown was whether the attacker had brought in the knife used in the stabbing or whether it was already in the store. However, the store did not operate a butcher department, and Sylvia's parents did not recognize the knife. About 10 minutes before the murder and robbery, an unidentified man in dark clothing was seen outside the store using the payphone. Investigators wondered if the man may have witnessed the assailant entering the store, but he's never been identified. In a nearby alley, less than a block from the store, another unidentified man was seen running down the sidewalk around the time of the murder. Investigators remain unsure if either of those men had anything to do with Sylvia's murder, and no other witnesses have ever come forward. In the years following the murder, law enforcement has interviewed and cleared over 20 persons of interest. In 2008, Hurricane Ike destroyed evidence in not only Sylvia's case, but dozens of other cold cases as well. However, a VHS videotape with footage from the crime scene, the murder weapon, and some bloody prints thankfully survived the storm. While the prints and knife are useful, the VHS footage remains the most significant evidence in the case as it provides an in-depth look at the crime scene and the people in the crowd outside the store. In 2020, the bloody prints found at the crime scene were resubmitted to the crime lab for testing, but there have been no updates on the results of those tests, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved.